to our channel. Thank you everyone who has subscribed, comment, liked on our previous cases. The Conjuring, Amityville Horror, the recent one of Alexis Sharkey as well. It's greatly, greatly appreciated. So today's case we're going to be covering is the Dirty John case. Now, like all the videos, I will do the full story to, again, let you build your own picture. I will put my psychic vibe in as and when I feel I have to or if I have an opinion on it. Bear in mind, it is only my opinion and my predictions. What I will do as well, I will do the spirit box at the end just to see if anything comes through. And please comment below at the end if you can hear anything in the spirit box. It really, really helps because once the video has been posted, it means then when we're all listening back, it sometimes builds a picture in the comments as well. Again, thank you so much. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe now. You will get a notification when we go live um, for free readings or for any of our cases that are up I do think it is important to start this case, um, again, just with a bit of awareness around dating sites, online dating, social media. We maybe think we know somebody by seeing their profile for the first time or just believing what they're saying to us. Bearing in mind, everything can look great on social media, whether it be online dating, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that's that person. Um, and also, you usually find when you get to know someone, you really do get to know them. So it's just a bit of awareness around social media. If you've never met someone before and you're chatting with someone, be very careful around that. And I hope, if anything, this case, case highlights um, what could go wrong. Let's get started on the story. So the story is The Dirty John. So you may have already watched the film, so you may already have a little bit of knowledge around it. The case involves a lady, Deborah Newell. Deborah Newell was an interior designer that did very well in business. She was very passionate about her business. She'd had her business for over 30 years. She was very financially stable, but she'd built her own wealth on her success. Now, this lady is the lady that's involved in the case, but what I want to do is give you a little bit of background around Deborah Newell, just so you can help build a picture with this. Um, Deborah did have a sister called Cindy. In 1984, Cindy was trying to get away from her abusive partner and divorce proceedings had started. And what had actually happened was Cindy and her ex-partner, Billy Vickers, had, um, had a fight in the kitchen and Billy had shot Cindy at point blank range in the head and killed her. But what he'd also done was he'd shot himself in the stomach and called 911. Sadly, the emergency services could not save Cindy, but they could save Billy Vickers. It was then classed that his injuries weren't that serious. It then went to trial a few months later. Now, this is where it gets bizarre. Cindy and Deborah's mum, Arlene, testified to defend Billy Vickers, saying that she loved him and that it was a moment of madness. Um, she also discredited her daughter, her daughter's character. Um, basically character assassination. You can imagine me being the mother um, and that's your own daughter and that's your daughter's murderer. Um, she was obviously shot at point blank range but Arlene then proceeded to defend Billy and have Billy in her life as well um, alongside this and sadly Billy was actually acquitted of the murder and it was due to Arlene defending him and testifying against his defence to why her daughter never got justice for that murder. It's crazy, isn't it? It makes you think. And again, bizarre relationships over the something else. Billy Vickers ended up pleading involuntary manslaughter and that was accepted and he was given five years, five years for murdering your wife. And his own, her own mother, sorry, even defending it. It makes you wonder, were they having some sort of relationship? Were there something going on? How could a mother do that to her daughter? It really, really does pose a lot, a lot of questions. Billy was also released in 1986. Fast forward a lot of years later, Deborah Newell was married four times, divorced four times and had four children. She had a passion for interior design. She was very good at her job and known as being very visual at her job. She did start her own company, Ambrosia Interior Design which she had for nearly 30 years. Now, although her professional life was booming, she was self-made, she came across her own wealth by the hard work that she'd put in. 
her love life, as she's known, four marriages under her belt, four divorces, um, was not so good. At this point in her life, she was looking for companionship. She was looking for someone who worked as hard as she did, held the same values, and especially the fact that she was so wealthy, she was very protective of that as well. Because all of this had happened, Deborah had been terrified of guns and it was suggested that she got a gun because she lived alone a lot, she was very, very wealthy and again she could have been a target but because again she had such a fear of what had happened in the past, she was very much against guns. That's where we are fortunate in the UK that we hold a gun law. Um, obviously America is very, very different for that. It would be insane for any of us to imagine having a gun in a house and if just in case anyone broke in or any of these different things. But in America, it's a very different way of living. Um, a lot of households do hold guns, again, for protection. And because there isn't a gun law in America, you can understand why that is. Um, I'm just so fortunate that, again, we live in Britain and that we do have these laws in place. Deborah was a very wealthy lady. She liked the finer things in life, nice dining, beauty, her hair, makeup, designer, Gucci, Cartier, Chanel. It was very obvious that Deborah was a wealthy woman. She was seeking companionship. She was single at this point. Again, probably a little bit guarded um, due to that as well, but maybe feeling a bit lonely in herself. You can have everything and have no one round about you. And psychically, just at this point, probably my first opinion, I do get that, that, and always remember this, if you're waiting on the breadcrumbs, you'll take the bread. John Meehan, he was born on the 3rd of February 1958 in California, San Jose. It was thought that John's dad was a manipulative man, he was abusive, he was a liar, he was a cheat, and that John was the exact same. Um, he could tell a lot of lies, he lived a lot of different lives, so he said that he lived a lot of different lives. What I get for that is he was a bit of a fantasist. From a very young age, John Meehan would pull off insurance scams, throwing himself in front of cars between him and his dad. They would also go to restaurants and break up glass or cr crush glass and put it into their meal or cut themselves and prove that it was in there. Now, these were all the types of insurance scams. Now, John was very, very young at this point when this was taking place. So you can imagine as him, his father telling him that's right is probably been the start of creating that monster, which his father already obviously was as well. Um, mirrored behaviour. Psychically, I do get John wanted to be like his dad, so he would have done whatever his dad said. And it's sad because a lot of boys feel the same. They look up to their father and, again, he was looking up to a man that was evil and it was a case that then he would become evil. John also sold drugs in his teenage years, cocaine in particular, and eventually he did have one arrest. One arrest. In 1988, he graduated in a bachelor's arts degree in the University of Arizona and then went on to go to the University of Law. This again is where it gets a little bit interesting. John's friends at that university called him Dirty John. That's where the nickname came in. And the reason it was was because that he could charm any girl and lure any girl in that he wanted. Now, this is, was his words and what they were seeing playing out. Some people even called him Filthy John. So I think that kind of sets the tone. They had obviously these sorts of mannerisms. What they did say is he was six foot two, hazel eyes, he was a handsome, good looking man, he was very fair, fair, um, friendly and again a bit charismatic, but he always thought he was right and everybody else was wrong. So there's a wee bit of arrogance in there with when him. John well. finally left the University of Law, he met a lady called Tanya Sales. Now Tanya Sales was a nurse, but like an anaesthetic nurse. She didn't have the authority um, as an anaesthetist as such, but they worked very, very closely with the doctor so she could be in charge of anaesthetic or morphine, pain medication, all these different things. It was a type of job where she worked closely with the doctor, although she wasn't fully qualified and she was the type of person that, again, if you were in labour, they would be telling you how much anaesthetic you need or even coming in and distributing that as well. So that was the type of job that Tanya had. John and Tanya got married in November 1990 at St Joseph's Catholic Church in Ohio. Now, at that time, Tanya was 25 and John was 31, as he said, all right. But in actual fact, John had told Tanya that he was 26 now, none of John's family went to the wedding. 
And the reason apparently for that was he told Tanya that they were addicts and again, all these different lies. So at this point, even the marriage is built in a lie, just starting with the age. Again, you can see the character of John's dad came out at that point, the manipulation, the cheating. And I do psychically believe that every lie he's told, he's told to self that's good for him. That's a selfish person if they're defending their cell and letting their cell come first. And I think that's a massive character thing within the John Meehan as well case. After John and Tanya got married, they went on to have two daughters. But also, John decided he wanted to be a CRNA, which is basically the same job as Tanya. What I find weird is, why would you want to do a job like that if you're a recovering drug addict? And why would somebody want to teach you to do a job like that if they already know that you are? Or did she know? That's the question. So again, Tanya helped John through his studies to then become a CRNA, um, which again is basically an assistant nurse around anaesthetic, but they must be supervised. To my understanding, they must be supervised with an anaesthetist doctor um, or somebody, another doctor within that field that can only authorise the administration of the drugs, basically. And John did go on to graduate at the Wright State University and then to Little Tennessee School of Anesthesia. Um, so he was fully qualified as well. Now, with a matter of time, the marriage started to break down. John was becoming very abusive, um, more than normal. He was being very, very nasty to Tanya. Obviously, they had two daughters as well. Ten years after marriage, John came to Tanya to see that he wanted the divorce. Now, she was a wee bit surprised by all this, but again, she just felt with these behaviours and the fact he'd been very irrational. So she decided to contact John's mum, Dolores. Now, John had always said to Tanya, never contact his family. But she felt at this point, because the behaviours were so bad, and she just realised she couldn't get anything on his past. It didn't matter how many times she tried. There was no sort of evidence there that could guide her in the right direction to what was going on. So she contacted Dolores. John's mum. Dolores told Tanya about the line of the age. He was lying about his full name. And also that he had a drug charge in California. Tonya then decided to dig a little bit deeper because his behaviour had been so erratic and things had changed. So she, she decided to check her house just in case that he'd been hiding any drugs or anything like that at all. And she did come across, it was a surgical anaesthetic. Um, she presumed that he was using it for recreational. But again, she wasn't sure that there was a chance that he could be selling it. So Tonya decided to call the police at that point um, to make them aware that John had these substances and that she didn't know if he was going to sell them or he was using it for recreational. The police took this very serious and they launched their own investigation in September 2000 to find out again if the theft had been taking place from the hospital and this is where he'd obtained those drugs in from. In January 2002, Ohio police investigator Dennis Luckin had taken on the case. Now he'd been told by one staff member at the hospital that John had come into the operating theatre with a gun. Another staff member had said they'd seen him stealing Dermacol instead of giving it to the patient. And instead of giving the patient the medication that they needed, he then gave them the saline so that he could steal the Dermacol. It's mad, isn't it? We have so much trust in our doctors and the people that look after us in these situations. Um, and then you wonder, well, when the staff seen it, was it reported at that point? Did they speak up at that point? That's the question. Psychically, I get everyone already knew what that man was like. I feel he always had that era presence about him. But it's again, like most days, or most people you meet, you think, I can't put my finger on it. And I think with a lot of people at that point, for him, they probably thought the same. He's got a warrant and searched John's house and they came across 45 containers with different types of medication. So it basically confirmed what the hospital workers had accused and said towards the other investigators. When this happened, he fled to a different state um, and it wasn't long before the police found him. Now, they found him in Michigan and he was unconscious with empty pill bottles round about him. They called an ambulance, they got him in the ambulance and halfway to the hospital, Dirty John wakes up, steals the drug box and flees the ambulance. So in the end, he was rearrested. he was jailed for six years and he served 17 months and he was out in the 2004. 
How can this man skip jail so many times at this point, especially when he's actually stole the drug box and fled the ambulance to people that are trying to hear us? Brings us to when John met Deborah. Now, Deborah was on a dating site for over 50s. She'd been out on a few dates and she'd kind of caught them out lying a little bit, but what I mean by that is they maybe lied about their looks or maybe it was petty things, it was small things. But when she met John, Again, he was on the same dating site. It was just a matter of time. When they met, she was very encouraged at the fact that John asked her more questions about herself. He was more interested in getting to know her. He came across as very charming, homely, wholesome, and basically everything you're looking for in a man. Now, at this time, he claimed he was a divorced man, he was Christian, he worked hard, and she was very, very impressed with his profile. Again, like most ladies, especially when they come across nice in the message, you think, oh God, they're everything they said there. Um, and I think psychically, I get that's what she was thinking at that point, that she probably thought, I've won a watch. How's he been single for so long? How many have thought that? As soon as John was messaging, Deborah was excited. She was taking it all in. He was basically telling her what she wanted to hear, that he had been a doctor and he was talking around the past stories, basically how he'd saved so many lives. He had a couple of kids, didn't say exactly how many. He said he had a couple of houses, but did say there was one in Newport and one in Pring, um, Spring Palms. Um, so again, she was thinking straight away, this is my type of man, he's doing well for himself. He's a doctor who's single, who's had a family, and who's doing something right for the world. Basically a doctor that's been given back. So they met in October 2014 and their first day at the Houston's restaurant in California. Again, he was giving her all the, to impress her, all these different things. And she was again falling hell, line and sinker. As a lot of us would do because what he's saying, she's believing. Even in the messages, he made her feel like a queen. He made her feel like she was the one. So even before Deborah met John at Houston's that day in October, she already had decided because even within the messages, she was already manipulated. He was encouraging. He was treating her like a queen. He was basically saying everything that she wanted to hear and she was believing it. He said pretty quickly to Deborah that on the first date, he wanted to meet her grandkids. He wanted to get in with the family that she completed them. So again, Deborah was feeding out the Pammy's hand. One thing she did notice though was that he was very touchy-feely on the first day. He was rubbing her hands down her spine. And again, at that point, Deborah was loving this, the physical attention, the fact that he was putting her on a pedestal. She decided to take him back to her penthouse. Now, I'm saying a penthouse, like this would have been a palace considering how wealthy Deborah was. When she took him back, he turned up the heat, was trying to kiss her, was trying to push himself onto her. She decided that is not who she is in her first date. Asked him to leave. He did get a little bit bitchy about it, but he did leave. Now, the next day, Deborah was a bit deflated, thinking he was just wanting a hookup. And that basically she got on with her day. But also, he'd made her feel a bit rubbish. She felt a little bit guilty that she hadn't put out. And it's another thing I get psychically. If you've ever incurred that situation where you've maybe went on a date with someone and they have been a little bit pushy and then the next day you've never heard from them and you think it's your fault, it's certainly not. But to the people out there that do it, on the other side of it, you have tendencies to dirty John. Which kind of just says it all. Um, I'm sure... There is a lot of people out there that have been in the same situation as Deborah at this point and thought, oh. but she did the right thing by telling him to leave at that point and she thought that that was it. Later that day, John begins to call Deborah over and over and he basically gets her on the phone and he apologises. He tells her he's been far too drunk. He doesn't remember it all and he is deeply, deeply sorry. She then goes off the phone to make a decision whether she's going to go out on another date with him. She texts him saying, so you are the real deal then? And he texts back saying, I'm the best thing that's ever happened in your life or that's going to happen in your life. Little did she know that that was probably the start of the shit storm. For a few weeks after that, they were with each other basically all the time, dating. By the third date, John had told Deborah that he was in love with her. It was all very, very full on. He was making her feel how she wanted to feel, but again, the pace was very quick around this. At this point, she just thought it could be a wee bit eccentric at time. 
in full on, but she didn't see anything to be worried about. Ron also told Deborah that he wanted to marry her. Now, this was all in the third date. Um, what Deborah did find weird was that John always wore blue scrubs. Um, and she said they were quite frayed at the bottom and sometimes they could look quite dirty. But a couple of weeks into dating, Deborah had been invited to a charity event. Now, surprisingly, John appeared, but he appeared with his scrubs on and he said to her, it'll impress your friends, they'll think I'm a doctor. So again, she just went along with it and was like, all right, I think psychically I get she was just glad that he turned up and I don't, I feel psychically she didn't know if he was going to turn up. Um, so she was just glad that he was there. But imagine that, like wearing the scrubs. So it was known that he was wearing the scrubs 24-7. Every time he seen her, he did have his scrubs on. That tells me it's about a personality disorder as well. Um, I know he's obviously been in that job, but he's obviously not accepting at this point. Um, I definitely think psychosis is involved in this. Deborah's friends found it particularly strange that he had attended a formal charity event with his scrubs on. Also, Deborah lived with one of her daughters, Jacqueline, who was 25. And as the relationship progressed, Deborah decided to move John into the penthouse. Now, Jacqueline already lived there and straight away, Jacqueline couldn't understand. Her quote was, he looked like a homeless loser because he was always wearing the scrubs. But what she also noticed with John as well is, it's as if he was eyeing up their art, all the things that were worth something. He was very keen to get close to Deborah's safe, which held all her kind of Gucci and designer things, the things with a lot of money. Eventually, Jacqueline said that the behaviours were enough for her to say that enough was enough and she wanted John out the house. Now, bearing in mind, Jacqueline was quite an outspoken daughter. So in the past, she had said to Deborah before about certain partners that she didn't like. So Deborah was half expecting this. And it makes me think, was Deborah thinking Jacqueline was just saying the same as before when Jacqueline did really notice something Jacqueline different. was obviously outspoken. And again, she was surprised that her mum, who took great, great pride in her appearance every day and great pride in herself, that was now dating someone and living with someone that had was dressing like this it was and again Jacqueline's quote a homeless loser and um, because it was the scrubs and she said that they were very very dirty most of the time Both Jacqueline and John didn't want to live with each other John decided to ask Deborah to move out of the penthouse and so that they could get their own home for the fact that Jacqueline and John didn't want to live together Jacqueline wouldn't tolerate it. She was already outspoken, but she felt very different and a bit stronger around this man as well. They then decided, now bearing in mind, exactly five weeks after starting to date, that they would take on a house for $6,500 a month in Newport Beach, where John and Deborah then moved to, while Jacqueline remained in the penthouse. Can you imagine after five weeks leaving your home, leaving your children for a man? I suppose everybody's different. When John and Deborah moved to this house, Deborah paid eighty thousand dollars up front for the house. So effectively, Deborah had paid for everything. Now John had then said he couldn't go on any of the lease documents due to tax reasons. So again, now De at this point, Deborah's family didn't know that she was paying everything, but he hadn't put his hand in his pocket. It loves blind. Our lust is blind in this instance. He was obviously making her feel very good about herself, but. Again, the fact that she's then distanced herself from her daughter, you can see where it's starting to go wrong and he's trying to isolate her. Um, and she's believing everything that's dribbling out his mouth. And I can imagine at a point like that, five weeks down the line, maybe friends and family don't want to say too much because they don't want to burst her happiness at the same time. Debra really thought she'd hit the jackpot with John. He was running all her errands for her. He was treating her like a queen. He was making her fresh coffee in the morning. She owned a Tesla and a Range Rover and he would take it for all the maintenance work. What I was been thinking at that point, what were you doing before you met me? How has he got all this free time all of a sudden? But again, she was in a bubble of love. convinced herself that when her daughters and her family seen how well that John was treating her, they would all come round. But what she did think as well was she had a younger daughter, Tara, who lived with her partner out in Las Vegas, who was training to be a groomer. And she was a little bit more mellow than what Jacqueline was. And she really thought that her and John would go on so much better. But when she explained to Tara the timeline and how fast things had moved, Tara also asked the question, why, if he was so perfect, was he single? And these types of things, again, it probably wasn't the response that Deborah was wanting from Tara. But again, it was 
a viable question, considering the sisters already seen right through this as well. So I can imagine Deborah thought at this point the world was against her, but again, John was feeding her with everything she had to know to keep going. Ada decided her and her partner Jimmy would go up to Southern California and meet John with her mum. Now, when they arrived, it was the day that they were moving into their new home, Deborah and John. Tara said that she got out and John was loading things into the house. He was she'd introduced herself, he came across as very cold, disinterested, and a little bit mean, she said, but she also said as well that he was holding this type of arrogance where he thought he was a bit of a macho man. He was putting everything into the house himself. He wouldn't let anyone help him. A total sign of arrogance. Just, just my impression, guys. But psychically, I do get it. She said at that point she found it weird as well. And she thought that he'd have shown a little bit more interest. Now, at first, she thought it was maybe because Jacqueline's approach to him. That he might be expected the same. But she said that his demeanour and everything was very cold towards her. And he took in a bed mattress on his own just trying to act like the big man, basically. Tara did start to see more red flags, as in, he didn't have a car. Why would a doctor not have a car? He spent all day at Deborah's playing computer games. The big screen that was up on the wall for the computer games, Deborah had purchased this herself. So Tara was starting to see all this for herself as well. Again, sometimes it's easier for an outsider to look in than being in that situation and evaluating it for yourself because lust and love are completely blind and it can send you off in a, a different direction, as I'm sure we all know. The day before Thanksgiving, Tara decided to look through John's things when he wasn't there. What she found was the certificate for his general nursing. When she questioned him about this, considering he had been saying he was a doctor, he had said he had got a PhD and advanced training which then made him a doctor but you can imagine it then escalated at this point because when John realised that Tara had been going through his personal things he went from not to ten. He was shouting and bawling at her, he told her that she just didn't want her mum to be happy and that they wanted to inherit money. He then, when all this was taking place, Deborah stood by, it didn't back Tara up, she let it all play out and let it happen. And John then further manipulated the situation by telling Deborah that her children wanted her dead so that they could inherit money and they never wanted her to be happy. The sad thing is, Deborah started to believe this. Arlene, Deborah's mum, now if you remember rightly, at the start of this video, that was the lady that backed the Billy Vickers, um, then decided to come for Thanksgiving and she decided to meet John. Now, bearing in mind, she probably didn't have a high expectation considering all the past and things that happened. But John knew that Arlene was very religious, so again, he played up to this. Straight away, she loved him, fell in love with the idea because of the Christianity side. So again, what we need to think around that is Arlene also backed Billy Vickers. Is Arlene also like her daughter that when a man says something, they nod their head and go with it? It's a very naive vibe that I get around the psychic side that Deborah was as weak minded as what her mum Arlene was but what type of woman defends your daughter's murderer just my opinion and psychically I get it was more to do with admiration and the fact that someone was given attention if that is the case Jacqueline was also at that meal and John had pulled her to a side to have a word with her Jacqueline freaked out and basically called him the devil now you can imagine the anger in John at this point because he then knew that those children had the capability to break him and Deborah up, but was also trying to convince Deborah that it was their agenda to do that and that just that they wouldn't be happy for her. Um, obviously, the fact that Arlene had liked him, he maybe thought that that was going to bring him a bit more stead with Jacqueline, but instead she was the opposite. So basically, Thanksgiving was a disaster and Deborah decided to get a therapist involved. Now, the therapist basically turned around and said to her that if you love John, then you can't have these boundaries set on you by your children and told her to go forth and be happy with John. As a mother, you shouldn't need a therapist to tell you to put your children first, whether they are 10, 25, 35, you bring your children into this world to look after them and protect them. And again, they're your family. I just think it's a little bit strange that you would need a therapist. Um, to advise you on something like that if both your grown-up children who have probably cared for you for a lot of years is giving you their opinion on something that especially around money and things so I think she was very clouded by love 
in loss, but also we do have to remember we bring our children into this world. We know what our morals, our parents are meant to be and what we are as role models. It doesn't matter how much you're in a situation, that shouldn't be forgotten. Deborah just got on with it. She wasn't very keen on how John dressed. Um, if you bear in mind that it was always scrubs he was in. So she decided to take him out and get a full new wardrobe, which probably suited John down to a tee because what she'd said was he just wears raggy t-shirts. Um, now, bear in the mind, this is meant to be a doctor, a man that should be quite wealthy. But the story he had told was all his designer clothes got stolen a rack. You surely at this point would be like that. Wait a minute, you've had a lot of bad luck. A lot, a lot, a lot of bad luck. Weeks later, John convinced... Now, Deborah was going on a business trip and took John with her to Las Vegas and they got married. She never told anyone. Now, bear in mind, this is in less than two months since they met. They are now married. She didn't want to tell anyone, but what she did know was it was coming up to Christmas, so the secret was going to be out eventually. <sighs> Signing your life away at that. Even have a wedding pick. Here we go. Christmas time, they were going to be having dinner at Nicole. Now, Nicole was Deborah's oldest daughter. She had agreed for John to come there, but the minute Jacqueline found out that John and Deborah would be attending Nicole's, Christmas dinner, she decided straight away she wasn't going. Tara decided at that point as well she didn't want to go. But Deborah had asked him to go to the therapist and Tara agreed to go to the therapist. It was then agreed while they were at the therapist that Tara would go, but she would stay away from John. Um, what Tara was worried about was the children that would be there as well around John. Now, John came in with presents for all the children that were attending. This upset Tara. Um, which then her grandmother Arlene noticed, who took her to her side and she explained to Arlene that she didn't like him, she felt that something was off and something wasn't right and that she was tra that John was trying to buy these children's affection. She then went back to Vegas and sadly stopped speaking to her mum for a while because right of this. At this point, daughter Jacqueline had turned into investigator herself. You know what women are like when we want an answer, we just do our own investigating. And that's exactly what Jacqueline done. And one thing that struck Jacqueline was, if he's a doctor, why was his hands so dirty? She said his hands were really, really filthy, filthy, dirty. And nine times out of ten, most doctors probably had the cleanest hands ever because that is obviously within their industry. Um, they were also re Jacqueline also received texts from Deborah to say that she had money missing out her purse, but there were texts that were miss like, misspelled and things like that. And they knew that they weren't coming directly from Deborah. It made Jacqueline wonder what he was doing all day. If he wasn't working at the hospital, what was he doing all day while Deborah was? So he drove her Tesla around a lot. So Jacqueline decided to put a tracker on the Tesla to find out exactly where, where he was going and what he was up to. That is women FBI for you. John had said that his job required him just as if he got a call, then he would go. The Tesla did show up that he visited a few doctor's surgeries, a fast food outlet, warehouse, nothing really untoward that could make think that was anything was going on, but they were trying to calculate the distance and the speed of where he'd been. John and Deborah also started going to church every Sunday. And one day they came home from church, there was a lady that they didn't recognise standing in the living room with wet hair. Um, John immediately grabbed the lady and scalped her head off a bunker and told Deborah to go outside and leave and phone the police. Now, they called the police. The police came and got the lady. Deborah decided not to charge, um, press any charges due to the fact she didn't know if it was mental health or what it was. But the police also believe now that did John maybe set that up to scare Deborah because then he wanted the security cranked up. had installed security cameras throughout Deborah and his home. Um, as well as security cameras in Deborah's office, so he could see everything that Deborah was doing, where she was. So I suppose, in hindsight for him, if whatever he was getting up to, he would know when Deborah was leaving the office. Very, very controlled, and that's what I do get with this man, John Meehan, that he loved the sense of control. He, he kidded on his somebody he wasn't, but he started to believe he was that person, hence the scrubs. But I feel deep down, he was a very, very insecure man that knew amounted to nothing, and that's why he kept going these extra miles. And he hated the fact when someone didn't like him. And the sad reality is, I honestly think the one thing about a psychological problem is, 
if you are troubled by how much people think of you. And in that instance, it was the case. He was more aware. He hated the fact that her children didn't like him and that they were starting to piece it together exactly who he was. David did start to wonder where John went every day and he would come home with wads of money and say that it was just an anaesthetic job. Again, he was being called in and given the money, but again, she was becoming quite suspicious with it herself. What she was also coming suspicious with was the amount of money that was coming in. But the fact that she knew nothing about his family, the same as Tonya was at that time as well, nothing adds up. So I think at this point is when Deborah started becoming suspicious at the fact that he was, was bringing in a lot of money into the house in cash. Um, and she couldn't really say exactly, definitively, where he was working, what area, what hospital. So I can imagine at that point she was starting to become quite suspicious. One day, Deborah watched the security footage herself and she seen John going out to work in his scrubs, coming back very quickly and heading back into the house and going to bed. The funny thing is, he's obviously wanted this security for the controlling factor, but in a sense, it's going to actually get him caught out as well. He had an excuse for everything, so he told Deborah that the patient had cancelled and that's why he'd headed back. You always find as well with these things, when someone like that is then under suspicion and they get wind of that, there's usually smoke coming off the back of their shoes because if they've told a lot of lies, they don't know what lie they've been caught on. He'd also said that he was in the borders of Iraq and the scars and things in his body were, again, to do with that situation. But he was also taking Oxy for this. Now, he was also injecting something as well. He told Deborah that he had bad kidneys and he was injecting testosterone now deborah's nephew shad was cindy's son now cindy was the sister that passed away at the start of this video at first he liked john he thought he was okay but he did find it a bit strange that john played computer games all the time he wasn't well dressed it didn't seem like he, he worked so again i think the full family had the same vibe and by the sounds of it john wasn't good doing a very good job of hiding his personality especially when Jacqueline's name was brought up around Shad one day and that John had turned around and said that he could take Jacqueline out from a thousand yards away and John, Shad found that very, very want to take his partner's daughter out. Again, family politics. I'm sure that's not the only family in the world that have came across things like this. Um, so I do think as well that at that point with Shad turning his back around in this situation would not have been good for Deborah or John because at that point Deborah had treated Shad like a son because he'd lost his mum and the fact that he was backing her up probably made her feel a lot better but again Deborah had the suspicions at this point as well she didn't know enough and what we've got to remember this was all done in quite a small period of time. Chad said that when the conversation took place that John could take Jacqueline out within a thousand yards, that Deborah was actual fact in the room and she was laughing about it. It changed Chad's full view of Deborah and John and their relationship, but also he then took his concerns to Deborah's daughters, who then informed him that they'd actually employed a private investigator to look further into John Meehan. What I find strange at this point is Deborah's making the same mistake as her mum and to laugh about something like that when it's your daughter, that it, it, I suppose it doesn't really matter if that, that's out of tone, that being said and him saying that as well and whether it's in joke or jest, it, it shows some sort of intention. I'm very baffled in this case to the females and their actions around it and their need and want for love so bad that they would risk their full family and relationships for it. Just my private thing. investigator did find a lot. They found that John had filed for bankruptcy. It was a nursing degree license that he had, certainly not a doctor's license. But they'd also found a few connections with him through different locations. And one was a trailer park in particular. When they called it, the lady that answered had said that she'd actually had a relationship with John and then just woke up one day and he disappeared. And you usually find that with liars like that, pathological liars like that. Is it's where they leave their hat. As soon as they've been caught, they move on. They, again, probably speak about their ex, like they're the one that's done wrong, because they need to validate that to themselves. So, again, I can imagine the lady at the trailer park, that is completely true for the sheer fact that he's probably manipulated the situation, got what he's wanted out of it. She's maybe became suspicious, and then he's been on to the next one. It happens daily. 
in this day and age, um, especially and unfortunately with naive men and women on both sides of the decided not to tell Deborah straight away, but Shad did call Deborah just to say that he was concerned and he didn't want to lose another mother because of a man. And she he'd also said to her that if he had proof that he'd been jailed and been in jail, would it make a difference? And Deborah's reply was she didn't care whether it was true or not. She was in love with him and loved him. It must have been so frustrating for the family that she was so manipulated at this point that she believed that man had the best interests at heart for her. But again, this is what we speak around psychosis and pathological liars. They believe it. They want They want to, in their head, they say they want to leave a legacy. They want people to remember them after they're gone. And especially with someone like John, he was desperate to be validated. Um, and when the family didn't validate him, he spat his dummy, and that's what you usually find with pathological liars when they don't get their Shad way. Shad did decide to keep his distance at that point, but it didn't stop Deborah letting John know what Shad had said. So John sent Shad a text. Obviously, he wasn't happy. That was someone else that was against their relationship. And he bas- basically said if Shad came near the house, that he would phone the police. And what's sad in that is that was Cindy's son. He relied on Deborah. They were very close. But at the same time, he didn't want anything to do with it at this point, so he took a step back. Now, one day, late March, Deborah received a letter. It was addressed to John, but she decided to open it. As she opened it, she couldn't even get past reading the first line of it, and John came from nowhere. Now, by the looks of it, he was watching on the security camera, and it was a letter from an inmate. Now, he went mental, screaming and shouting, so Deborah really got to see John for what he was. But also, he then came up with the excuse that it was a pen pal and that he'd signed up for this. This made Deborah extra suspicious because it confirmed. had confirmed what Shad had said. But also, John had texted Shad abuse, threatening behaviour, but also said quite derogatory things about Shad's partner, which really flared Shad up and which was another reason why Shad wanted distance. Um, when she found this letter, it confirmed everything that Shad had said. She'd done a wee bit of further digging the next day when he went out to run errands and she found that he was a former nurse, but he'd been hooked in painkillers. Um, he had lost his full career down of it. He had been arrested and he was actually a con man from 2005 to 2014. And there were also court records that were swindling, seducing and terrorising women that he'd met um, by posting on a dating online app, saying that he was a doctor. So he'd been on the dating apps posing as a doctor before and other women had experienced this so Deborah was finally finding this out I can't imagine how she felt she must have felt so silly considering she gave up all her family at this point also found out that another woman in Laguna Beach age 48 had also went to the police to say that John had been trying to take her money um, and she had ended the relationship now that lady was in hospital and she woke up out of surgery and when she woke up John was there she was going through a divorce at the time and he'd basically said to her, put all your money into my account so you're a strange family, can't get any of your funds. Now, she didn't do it and she ended the relationship, but she also found out that he had three restraining orders on him before he married Deborah, but also there was pending restraining orders as well. They searched his house and in the report they'd found 38 special handguns, cable tie pockets. They also found like things to obviously knock people out so it looked very dangerous Deborah was very worried at that point that obviously her family were right for once but was she and her family at risk now and what was he going to do when they he found they found out um that he yeah. also discovered as well was that he was released in the 8th of October two days before he met Deborah she also learned about the Dirty John nickname which frightened her I think at that point you would be everything would be hitting you what your family's been telling you for weeks and weeks and again I can imagine there's a sense of this wasn't real there's a sense of self worth there as well um in the mental health side of it so I can imagine she felt pretty pretty low finding that out but also she probably felt very very stupid for not believing it or not doing her own homework before now. The thing Deborah did was call her therapist for anti anxiety tablets. I would be wanting a refund for the advice. Just my opinion. Um. Then what she did was she contacted her lawyer. Now, the lawyer said to her, first things first, we need to get him out the will. Yep. After that small amount of time, John had made it into Deborah's will. 
Well, that was been arranged. She was very, she wanted to keep things quite quiet. Didn't want John to know. Now he'd went into the hospital for a back problem, basically to get a refill in his medication. So she's seen this as a prime opportunity to move out the rental house. The family helped her move out. You can imagine when they started moving everything out, they found more things. They found a print out of a website called, I'll just get this, the dealingcycle.com. And there was a lot of comments and stories directly about John on that. And he printed them off for some reason. So they'd found them in this river, mm-hmm. multiple pages on him saying, don't date this man. He tries to take your money. He's very persuasive. One lady said that she grabbed um, he grabbed her with the throat. Basically stay away from him. Deborah was sure at this point that that, again, it was all there in black and white. Everything that she'd been told for weeks, she didn't believe. She now firmly, firmly believed it. She just didn't know how she was going to tell John that she was leaving. He was in the hospital at this point. They had cleared everything out in the house. Deborah texts John to let him know that the relationship had ended. He totally freaked out. He was sending her abusive messages. He also said his family were part of the mob and they were going to take her out. Now, she went to the private investigator who basically said to her, you have to change your appearance. You can't be in the same place for the next wee while, just in case. So she was advised to change her appearance, (coughs) change her hair, basically change everything about her, drop the designer clothes, because it meant she'd be less of a target and that John wouldn't find her. Now, in this time, John was still texting her from the hospital, begging to see her. Now, bearing in mind she's fearing for her life, but she still decided to go to the hospital and see John, and yet again, he got his wicked way, where he, again, talked her into going back with him, and giving her a second chance, he apologised for everything, he just said that she wouldn't have forgave his past, that's why he never told her, the usual cock and bull, the usual cock and bull, agreed to help him with his drug addiction, so again, she was going to be the nurturer taking on, so at this point, Jacqueline had a lot of control over John, but the reality is, no she didn't, because she was taking herself back to a bad situation when she already knew. Yet again, she picked a man over her children. Jacqueline hated John, which we all knew. And it got to the point in March 2016. Now, they were only married one year, three months at this point. Deborah was becoming suspicious again, um, especially around the drug addiction side. The fact that Jacqueline hated him wasn't helping the situation. And what actually happened was that Deborah decided to pay for Jacqueline's real estate school fees um john found out and what he did was he made her stop paying for jacqueline's fees but also called jacqueline's school and basically slated jacqueline to all her teachers and all the pupils if that doesn't do it for you it should have been way past that i am baffled at this case baffled at this case for the reason that one mother could make so many errors unconditional love is completely different to falling in love and if you can choose lust and love and excitement over unconditional love your own children it sometimes doesn't make you any better don't even text Jacqueline yet again abusive texts he's keyboard warrior by the way mummy wants nothing to do with you and I'm going to kill you he also said jump off a tall building that'll make me smile head first would work what type of person, not what type of man, what type of person sends texts like that and feels so abusive and so angry towards someone, especially a different gender, a man to a woman. But what type of mother sits back and allows that man to send those messages to her own daughter? This case has, I'll be honest, it's really got my heckles up looking at this case and doing this case on a psychic level. There's a lot, a lot of selfish characters in this case. And again, it is going to differ on opinion. Like, was she a victim, Deborah? Was she not a victim? One of my conclusions coming very shortly. March 2016, Deborah's suspicions became more and more and she became pretty scared. She came to breaking point, basically. His behaviours were getting worse. She was trying to assist with his drug addiction. It wasn't making an ounce of difference at this point. But he was becoming more and more abusive to Deborah. She decided to try and get the marriage in old, but she was worried that John was going to find out. So she was stashing money in different places just to get herself prepped up. There were £30,000 in her bedroom and John found it. Now he threw it at her feet and she said, that's my money. He basically said, what's well, yours is mine. At that point, he was starting to click on that Deborah was going to leave him. He totally freaked out. 
Deborah freaked out as well at this point and she made the decision to just grab her makeup, her work clothes and leave the property and went to stay with her daughter Jacqueline. Now John also left the property and went to stay in one of Deborah's houses in Nevada. At this point, now even though they weren't living together, John was still texting constantly abusive messages and one it was those reasons that Deborah went to her daughter's house, Jacqueline's, was because the complex had security cameras so they could hide out and they felt safe there as well. Now, Deborah had asked the Orange County judge for a restraining order, but apparently it's actually very hard to get one. And it was denied because it was seen that he was in Nevada and it was a different state, so it wasn't classed as an imminent threat. What I do think is sad that that is, now again from personal experience as well, they don't act quick enough around things like this, so it takes for something to happen or the police will say to you something has to happen first before they, they'll carry anything out or do anything. And in this instance, if they look back on John's own report, they would have been able to see that he was an imminent threat of some sort because he looked past behaviour. This frightened Deborah a bit, that again she couldn't get the restraining order. And at that point, she realised that he was still getting away with it. And again, probably what all the other women had went through as well. So she just decided to ignore John's messages and cut ties altogether. And one day, she was driving to work in her Jaguar and she'd parked it in her office car park. And then what had happened was the car had been stolen. Now, I mean by stolen, it had been taken a block away and set a light on fire. But what had happened was the car had little damage. It, the fire had basically went out. I don't know if that's to do with the make of the jag or just the way. He'd failed basically lighting the fire. But he was on CCTV where they'd got him taking the car. Now, again, he then didn't get charged because although it was on CCTV, I'm gathering it was classed as, again, like a civil matter because it was domestic. So, yet again, he got away with that. Um, and again, the Irvine didn't charge him. That baffles me. Yet again, if they looked at his history and his previous record, they would be able to see that he is an imminent threat. He does have these tendencies. I'm sure that's something that's been questioned throughout the case as well. But it also doesn't help when you have a willing participant, a.k.a. Deborah. Now, at this point, she's not went back, but in the past she has. In my experience dealing with domestic abuse through clients is... Especially if the client's got a habit of going back, they don't necessarily take it serious right away because they're worried that they start the investigation and then that you maybe pull out of it because of the manipulation. It's a very, very sad situation for anyone to when be in. this happened, at that time, Jacqueline, <coughs> Deborah had got in touch with Jacqueline to let her know that he was back in the area. But Jacqueline has also got in touch with Tara, her sister, to let her know. Now, Jacqueline then realised later that day that John was sitting outside her complex watching. Now, Jacqueline being the forthcoming character that she is, and straight to the point, she chased John, but she literally chased him out of town. He didn't stop. They couldn't get him to stop. So at that point, again, he was on camera doing August this. August 20th, 2016. <clears throat> Tara, Deborah's daughter, comes home from work. Normal day, pulls into the car park where she lives. As she's getting out, John approaches her. He starts attacking her with a knife. Now, he's trying to push Tara into the car, which would suggest that he's trying to take her away in the car. Now, he could have been trying to take her to the hospital. But he's waving this knife about. She's wearing rain boots, so she eventually she kicks him. And as she kicks him, they're wrestling about the floor. She gives him another kick. He, she knocks the knife out of his hand and grabs the knife and stabs him 13 times. And on the 13th stab, she stabbed him right through the eye into the brain. Now, when the paramedics got there, he was still alive. He still had a pulse. A neighbour had came out to help Tara to give her a towel to fix her injuries. But again, at this point, he was still alive and taken to the police. They searched John's car and found duct tape. They also found cable ties, testosterone injections, as well as his passport. So it's thought that he was going to try and abduct Tessa and take her out the country, but either way, he was certainly fleeing the country. Um, he died four days later. Now, he was at age 57 at this point, and obviously because everything had happened, it was his sister Karen, who also disliked him, had to make the decision to switch off his life support. There was no memorial for him, and there was nothing whatsoever. Everyone who knew John hated him. Now, Deborah lives in Nevada, 
she is now helping with other domestic abuse victims and it was put on the record in 2019 that she said she would never use online dating again. It's now time for the conclusion, guys. the spirit box first. Now, the reason is, obviously, if we can connect with Joan, I ask you to comment and put your comments below. The spirit box can be quite hard to hear and it can give you a little bit of a sore head as well. But I will do this for the first little while and then I'll give you my conclusion, all right? Spirit, if you are with us, give us a sign that you're here. And if you are John Meehan, give me a sign or come through the spirit box that you are with us. You're stuck. Where are you stuck? Someone was forced to get naked. John, who was forced to get naked? John, why were you so insecure? Were you, John, were you aware as a man that you weren't capable of holding the traits of a man? Is that why you were validating yourself? Can you name any of the other victims? Dolores. 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 Is his name John? Were you bad to your mum? I'm just going to get this and he's fucked in the head, fucked in the head. I'm just going to stop it. Um, I, again, don't like doing the spirit box around murderers. I feel you're giving them some sort of gratification and appreciation that they don't deserve. What I'm going to do is give you my conclusion. Again, it is just my opinion, my predictions and what I get psychically around this full case. And thank you so much for watching to this point. Please, please subscribe, like, comment, just the usual YouTube saga. My conclusion of this case is that Deborah had such a need and a want for love that everything got put to a side. And between John's manipulation and her nature that she felt she needed to be loved. And again, it could be because her daughters were older. She maybe felt more alone. And again, thought they don't have much of a say over that because of the age of them. But in actual fact, her children were trying to look out for her. What I disagree in this case is, is how far that case went before she realised that something wasn't right. I can't stress it enough to anyone out there who's speaking to anyone online. Don't be scared to Google their name. Don't be scared to do a bit of more homework. You're not being a psycho doing that. You're being a psycho if you're appearing at someone's house and they don't want to be there, all these different things. But you're certainly not being a psycho if you're doing a bit more homework on a current partner. Because always remember this as well. A new partner will always tell you their ex-partners this, that, the next thing. In actual reality, it's quite likely they're speaking out their own insecurities. And that's what I think's happened around this situation. Debra had a greater need to be loved and wanted and validated. And she took the breadcrumbs. It's what we spoke about at the start. She obviously didn't think much of her self-worth. History was repeating itself. She'd been through a lot in her younger years. But I don't think it's any excuse for picking a man over your children. And again, it could sound a bit harsh, it's just my opinion, but psychically I get that when she said in 2019 she wouldn't go on any further online date, and I feel she only said that because there's somebody else in the scene. And I actually feel already that people don't agree with the person that's round about her. Mistake, first time, honour, but second time, more fool her. Um, I do think that there's probably resentment around her children to this day and I do feel that Tara took the right approach for the sheer fact and it's not that I agree or disagree but I feel the reason she took the approach was she's seen that as an opportunity. Like the police said, we can't do anything, he does something and she's seen that and that's what John she took. Meehan was a pathological liar. He believed his own lies. He thought he was something he wasn't. And what was happening was when he was meeting all these naive women, they were validating that. They were because he was feeding them the shitty stories. Um, they were feeding into that and again the restraining orders that were knocked back through the Orange County judge which probably didn't help the situation either but again it probably assisted the whole domestic abuse 
we speak a lot about domestic abuse now more than ever. And if anyone is in that situation at the moment and you're watching this case and thinking, I feel so much like that person or it reminds you of certain things, it's time to get out. It's time to call either the Samaritans or gain help, but don't be scared to make that move. Because again, we never know. Jealousy is one of the biggest killers. Jealousy and manipulation. And characters like that, when they don't get what they want, that's when they become evil. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the case this evening. Again, another case next Sunday. I hope you all stay safe and take care. And thank you for watching our channel.